Hey everyone, in today's video, I am sharing 10 quick examples of multi-sensory learning. Now, in many of my videos, especially over the last two years or so, I have made a point to mention multi-sensory learning in both math and literacy, uh, just because of the benefits of it for teaching students all different skills, phonics, reading, writing, math. Now, when we're talking about multi-sensory learning, we are really focusing on these four main things right here. We are talking about visual input, auditory input, kinesthetic input, and tactile input. And when we're talking about multi-sensory learning, we need our students to be using more than one of these at a time. Now, just for a little more information on each, visual learners rely on what they see, so they are going to be using their eyes to take in information here, so maybe you're writing something on the board, using illustrations, a visual presentation, essentially they're going to see what they need to learn. In a similar way, auditory learners learn by absorbing information through their ears, what they can hear. So they remember best when information is being said aloud as opposed to being, you know, written down or shown visually. Then we have kinesthetic learners who often learn best by doing. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of hands-on instruction, a lot of manipulatives, moving our bodies, things like that. And lastly, we have tactile learners. And tactile and kinesthetic learning can sometimes be confused, but tactile really refers to the sense of touch. So think about actually like writing things down, holding a pencil. Well, kinesthetic deals with more of a whole body movement and muscle feelings, for example. So essentially, when we are giving our students multi-sensory instruction and wanting them to do multi-sensory learning, we need to make sure we are including more than just one of those learning modalities. Now, many teachers, self-included, are guilty of thinking we're doing some multi-sensory instruction when actually we are just doing like a hands-on type of thing. Maybe it's either kinesthetic or it's tactile, um, but unless we're also giving them that auditory or visual input, it's still only one modality. So in today's video, I have 10 quick ones. I'm going to do five examples of multi-sensory instruction to use in literacy and five examples of multi-sensory instruction to use in math with some quick examples. This is not going to be an extensive list. In fact, it's going to be a very small list, but hopefully by looking at each of these five, you can also think of other ways you can incorporate multi-sensory learning in your classroom. So if you're ready to see these 10 examples, give this video a like, subscribe to my channel, and let's just get started. Alright, let's start with the five literacy examples first. I'm going to quickly explain what each one is and then I will show you how I would use it in my classroom. Activity number one is going to be including some sand. So sand can be a little intimidating to teachers at first because, you know, it seems a little messy. I like to keep mine in some sort of cheap plastic um, containers so that way students can grab it. We can cover it up nice and tight and store them somewhere. Like I would not have them keep this in their desk. We'd probably have an area for it. But essentially with sand, what you'll want to do is you will want to tell students aloud and have them make the letter that matches. So you'll say, what makes t? So you're giving them a sound, auditory, and then they're making it. T makes T, then they shake it. What makes CH? C H makes CH. Then you might tell your students, okay, you know a few ways to make this sound. What makes A? They might know some vowel teams, so A I makes A. A Y makes A. A makes A. And then they can clean it off in between each one. But as you hopefully notice, I am saying the sounds aloud, they are making them, and then they're also repeating what I'm saying, so they are saying it while they're creating it. Now, doing it with our finger is going to be a kinesthetic type of movement, but if you wanna make it more tactile, you can give students a pencil or something fun here like this paintbrush, and they can do the same thing. What makes t? T makes t. So now they're still doing that pencil grip and they are actually getting to form that letter. And also if you have students that don't like the sensory sand, hi, it's me, I don't love it. Um, I mean, I know some people think it's very calming. It doesn't drive me crazy, but I don't love it. And I don't like the feeling afterwards, especially. So I would much prefer to use a paintbrush. What makes ch, c, h makes ch. Now in a very similar fashion to sand, you can also use something like this uh, bumpy board. It's like a plastic screen that you can buy at Home Depot. Um, the Imsy Orton Gillingham training gave us one of these and told us about it. And it essentially is going to do the same type thing. So what makes ch, c, h makes ch. 
it's a lot easier to store and it's less messy and it's going to give students that same feeling. What I don't love about it is they can't see it. In the sand, they can actually see the CH. But here you can incorporate a visual and you could have students um, put like a big letter T over it and they're saying T makes T. T makes T. And they're tracing the T here. So now they have the auditory of them saying it, they're seeing a visual, and they have this tactile feeling. So this is another option. Activity number two is going to be sky writing. Now this is such a simple one to implement that I love using it, and it's great for kinesthetic learning, so we're gonna be moving our muscles, moving our body, and essentially when you are doing sky writing, you are having students write in the sky. Now I like to use this activity basically the same way I do with a sand tray, and all students will do is put their writing finger up in the sky, and they will form some letters. So maybe we're doing the letter A, right? So we will have students say A. Remember, they're saying it and they're making it, A. Maybe you're talking about letter formation. So you teach students, okay, to start at the top line, and maybe you've taught them a little rhyme or some verbiage for how to make the letter A. So maybe they know to go around, bump the ground, come back up, come back down. Now, I just made it up myself, that's not a very clever rhyme, but I do know plenty of kindergarten teachers have little rhymes for how they make each one. Um, and so I would have students say that aloud as they go ahead and form that letter. Now maybe you're focusing on letter sounds and you might have them put their hands in the air and you might tell students to write the letter that makes this sound, B. And they will go ahead and make a B, B and they can say it aloud. So they're hearing it from you, they're actually making it, they might also be saying it. So they are combining different learning modalities. And their hands don't get messy from sand. Activity number three is a recent student favorite, and that is to include some of these poppets. All right, next up we have poppets, and these are great for phoneme segmentation and phonemic awareness practice. Um, you could get any, any type of poppet. These are like little tiles I have, and they're already separated. Um, any poppet board would totally work in the same way. And you could just ask students, how many sounds are in cat? Ah, three, three sounds are in cat. So again, they're hearing cat, but they're also pressing it as they say it. K at cat. Then students flip it over and they can go again. How many sounds are in the word ship? Sh, I, p, ship. Three sounds. Little balls of Play-Doh will essentially do the same thing where they get to actually push it down, which is fun for students, instead of just uh, moving up a cube, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, the actual act of pushing each one down is fun, and they can visually see that these ones are down and these ones are not, so there are only three sounds. Play-Doh balls do the same thing. You could have them roll little balls and smush it. Um, sometimes Play-Doh balls are a little more distracting than these, believe it or not, so, you know, either one's gonna do the same thing. Activity number four is to go ahead and use some cubes or some letter tiles. Now, technically, these are probably two different tools, but I'm gonna show you an activity that you can use with both of these. All right, next we have cubes or letter tiles, and I say both because they can be used in similar ways, but they're going to include slightly different uh, modalities here. So, like I said, you could easily have students do the same thing as the poppers. How many sounds are in cap? K, ah and they're just moving them up, and as they do, they can see three. And you know what, it's even a little faster than the poppets, even though they don't have that fun push down effect. But I also love using cubes for phoneme manipulation. So you might say, okay, how many sounds are in cap? K, ah, p. Take away k and replace it with m. Mm. What do you have now? Map. Take away m, mm, replace it with k. What do you have now? Cap. And students can get used to deleting the initial phoneme and then replacing it with a new one through cubes that don't have any letters. Now I say that because the next step is going to be to introduce some visual. So here we still have that auditory, but we also have the visual and the kinesthetic. We have the moving, but we also have images here. So make the word tap, t, ah, p, take away t, replace it with m, mm, map. Take away m, mm, replace it with k, cap. So I always love to use cubes first just so students can get used to removing the sounds and replacing them. But then I quickly add in the visual here so students can see the graphemes that represent the phonemes. And literacy example number five is to include some sort of movement when you are teaching your students about letters. Now I don't mean that in the sky writing way when we were talking about letter formation and kind of reviewing different things, but I mean when you're actually introducing a new sound to your students, you might want to give them some sort of movement 
um, and attach it to a visual so students can remember that sound. For example, the foundations program teaches students the letter U, uh, the sound uh, with this type of card right here, and students say U, up, uh. So they have that visual of the up arrow. But then also I've seen teachers go uh when they're doing that sound, when they're kind of dragging on that sound, they do a little thumbs up and it's going in an upward motion. So they will say U, up, uh, U, up, uh. So they are looking at a visual, they're saying it aloud, they are also doing a kinesthetic movement. Another one would be for the sound ah, or the letter O. So students would say O, octopus, ah. And they actually do a circle and they make their mouth in that correct form to form a circle like an O and they trace it around. Now again, this is great because they are seeing that visual, they're doing a kinesthetic movement, they're hearing that sound. They have all those different modalities to try to figure out this new learning. They have many more different ways to make those connections in their brains. The O1 comes to mind because numerous times over the past couple years, I have been working with students and they might be sounding out a word, let's pretend it's hop, um, and we'll have, and then I'll say, okay, what sound does the next one make? And students on their own will go, ah. Like they will do that movement first and you can see it clicking, right, right? They see the O, they know they do this and it helps them remember that sound. So that's just another great way to attach some visuals as well as some movements to our sounds. All right, let's move on to five quick examples for multisensory learning in math. The first is going to be to use a 10 frame. Now I have an entire video on how I love to use 10 frames in the classroom. Looks like that right there. Go check it out. Love that video. But let me show you an example. Now I love using 10 frames for so many different reasons. It is a great visual when they can see each box in the 10. So then you can go ahead and ask students to build six. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? We have a visual, they're going in each box. We have a kinesthetic, we are moving each one. And then I'm also counting them out. So students are hearing it as well. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Then I could ask them how many more make 10? And they can either just use the visual, they can count the empty boxes, or I like to have them actually fill in the tens frame. One, two, three, Four. Again, they're counting it along, they're seeing the visual, and they are filling it in. This is great for number decomposition because I can see that six plus four equals 10. Then I can say, all right, let's remove them all. Only put up five red cubes. Here we have five. Now, how many more make 10? And again, they can do the same thing. They have a visual, they're moving one by one, they can feel it, they can see it, and they can hear it if they're counting. The second example is going to help your students with geometry, and that is to cut and build shapes. Let me show you what I mean. When students are learning geometry, having them actually build these shapes is essential. Um, this is from a little pack that I got from Learning Resources. It's called Diving Into Shapes. I have shared it in the past before, but you can do this with Play-Doh and toothpicks or straws and marshmallows, all sorts of different ideas. You can also, of course, have students um, use that paintbrush. They could paint some shapes. They can go ahead and draw them using tactile, using a pencil. Um, but I like to also have them go ahead and build it. So here we might say build a square. And you might have students go ahead, they might see a visual of a square, they will hear a square, and then they have to go ahead and build it. Now I just made a video on this, but if students are working on fractions, I love having them actually partition themselves and cut a fraction. So I might say, look at this rectangle here, how can we cut it in half? And some students might wanna cut it this way, some will go ahead and cut it this way, and they actually have to cut the rectangle in half. And then I'll have them say the words, this is half of a rectangle. How can I cut this rectangle into fourths? So then they might say, okay, we have it in half and we can go ahead and cut it this way. We can cut it here to make it into four equal parts. Example number three is probably one most of you already use in your classroom, but that is to go ahead and use some cubes and you can use them for so many different things. Let me show you. Like I mentioned, I am sure most of you already use cubes in math. They can be used for so many different things. For example, cubes when doing one-to-one -one correspondence and counting is essential. How many times have you seen it when you ask students, okay, count how many are here? And they're like, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six cubes, because they're just counting, right? They don't have that one-to-one -one correspondence. So when you teach students to use that one-to-one -one correspondence and only say a number when you're moving an object or pointing to it, physically touching it, then students actually understand what that one represents. So one, two, 
three, four, four cubes. They're getting that auditory and the kinesthetic by actually having to touch them. Now, same when we work with addition or subtraction. I have two plus two, two cubes, plus two more equals one, two, three, four, four cubes, auditory, kinesthetic. And just for good measure, of course, we can do it with subtraction as well. Four minus one, let's actually physically take it away. Four minus one is one, two, three. Example number four is to use story mats and you can use them with cubes or any other manipulative, but let me show you how they work. For story mats, I wanted to pull out this book. Story mats are, you know, a bajillion years old. And so this is a resource from this book right here, Kathy Richardson, this was like in 1993 or something. Um, but they have some storyboards. I'm sure if you look up some lines, sometimes they're called counting boards. You can find some, but we have a cave down here. We have a barn, we have a tree, we have ocean. So essentially what students will do is they will use any sort of manipulative and you will have your students put a number, count however many you want in the barn. So you might say, put four pigs in the barn. One, two, three, four. Then I would have students make up a story problem about these four pigs being in the barn. This is a great precursor to actually answering word problems and story problems because they can come up with their own. We might say, okay, four pigs were in the barn, two of them went to the mud. We remove two, how many are left? One, two. If you had little farm animals, you could use that here too. Um, I didn't, cubes always work just fine, but essentially you have a story mat, you have students creating a story, you have the visual here, we have the auditory, and we have kinesthetic. And example number five is going to be to use our fingers. Now we can do this a few different ways, but tapping first comes to mind. Um, I'm always thinking about when I'm teaching my students how to count on, right? If they have nine plus two, I want them to put nine in their head and they're kind of holding it here. And then I have them count on those last two with their fingers. So nine, 10, 11, nine plus two is 11. Um, eight plus three, eight in our head, nine, 10, 11. These taps right here, they're placeholders for our students, but it's also a nice kinesthetic movement for them to remember those other three, right? They're counting it in a way where they don't need to grab something, they don't need to grab a cube, but they also don't need to hold it in their head. They can kind of tap it out. Students can do this when they're older too, when they are learning multiplication. Let's say we're doing four times five. They can skip count by fives four times and tap out to kind of make those groups, right? We have four sets of fives. So they have five, 10, 15, 20. Four times five is 20. Now those examples include a kinesthetic and an auditory, but you could do the same thing with tactile. Um, instead of tapping out fingers, students might want to draw dots. Also with the counting out strategy, sometimes I've had students put, you know, nine in their head and instead of tapping out two more, they just draw two more dots. So they say nine, 10, 11. Okay, seven, eight, nine, 10. The dots are gonna do the same thing as the tapping. And again, it kind of takes all that pressure off holding the numbers in your head. If students maybe can't visualize them or see them, um, this is a way for them to represent those numbers. So there you have 10 quick examples of multi-sensory learning and what it might look like in a K through two classroom for both literacy and math. Like I said earlier, this is not a comprehensive list. There are so many types of multi-sensory activities that you can use with your students to help them learn. At the very least, I hope this video helped you brainstorm some ideas that you can take and use in your own classroom right away. If there was an activity that you love from this video, let me know down in the comments, or if you have some of your own multi sensory activities that your kids love doing, also let me know down there. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up so I know. Make sure you are subscribed to my channel and click that bell. That way you're notified of every new video. See you in the next one. Bye.